Hello everyone and welcome to building a basic orbital rocket with the realism overhaul set of mods in Kerbal Space Program. This video assumes that you created an install similar to one that I had in the how to install realism overhaul in Kerbal Space Program video, which means you don't have any additional part mods, you've only got the required realism overhaul mods as well as the ones I added as well with the mech jab and persistent rotation and such. Uh, so we don't have a whole lot of parts, which means that if you can build an orbital rocket with these parts, uh, given that we don't have a lot of selection, it'll only become easier if you've got a wider selection of parts to work with, and uh, it'll make it a lot more fun too, frankly. Uh, this is very restricting with only these parts, with the stock parts as modified by the mods. So yeah, I, I will get into the other part mods and mods that you might want in a subsequent video. But for now, let's try and uh, do it this way, which will be more familiar to people anyway. And so we have here a probe, and we have a dish, we have a reaction wheel, we have a hex core, which is now called the Ranger Block 3 core to match the stats of a real probe core for the Ranger probes. We have uh, solar arrays, as you might be familiar with. We've got the Oscar refuel tank, and we've got what is now called a one kill newton, uh, kill newton thruster. Okay, uh, you'll know feed pressure too low. Okay, we'll get to that though. First, I want to talk about electric charge. Electric charge, as I click on this Ranger Block 3 core, you'll note that it has 15,840. Well, that's a lot more than, than we're used to seeing in stock, right? Well, that's because the units for electric charge have been changed to more standard units. And so if we take a look at our solar panels, they give 270 watts. Well, that's the Mark II. We're using Mark I. They give 189 watts. Now, watts have the, the time built in. What that really means is joules per second. So it's 189 joules per second. Joules is the measure of energy. Watts is the flow of energy. And so the flow of energy to these solar panels, through these solar panels, is 189 watts. Um, one of these, uh, basically what that means is uh, for every second, uh, it will consume 0.189 of these units. Okay? And so if it was one kilowatt, if the electric charge, uh, or it'll regenerate actually because these are solar panels, not consume, regenerate. If it was one kilowatt, then every second it would replace one unit of electric charge here. And uh, let's uh, see if we've got a good balance with our solar panels and our probe cores. We've got 189 watts per solar panel. We'll assume it's facing the sun tail on so that the solar panels have the best effect. And so we've got three of them. It's about 540 watts, uh, 189 times three. Uh, that's actually 567. But anyway, you don't have to do it round round things, it'll help you. Uh, rounding is good. But, um, so, if it was 189, you know, I just say 100. So, let's say 300, we know it might be closer to 600. But the Ranger Block 3 core needs 80, so we're good there. Uh, we've got a reaction wheel. We don't have to use it constantly, though, and it only takes 100. The reaction wheels are, as I've said, underpowered, but you'll want them for your probes so you don't have to use fuel to turn them constantly. They're really good for the probes, not so good for controlling rockets or big vehicles, because you can see the torque is now 0.1. But, and the biggest one is only one torque, right? And still, that's, that's more than you'd get from a real one in real life anyway. So it's still generous, technically speaking. Uh, 100 watts, uh, good, so 180 total. The dish isn't configured for the watts. And that's because this doesn't have remote tech in. If you have remote tech in, I think it'll have a watt number instead of the normal one. And that's because it's not on constantly. It's not working constantly. That's just while it's transmitting. And uh, those units will still be the same as these units. So when it's transmitting, 68.6 uh, per second is not much considering how much electric charge we've got. And that's all that's going to be consuming any power. So we're good with the solar panels. We've got more than we need. And let's talk about the fuel. Okay, well, we've got this cute little one kilonewton thruster and it says feed pressure is too low. That's because there are, there are numerous kinds of engines and uh, there's the kind of engine that you have to sell the fuel down in order to start it. And there's another kind of engine where the tanks have pressurization to push the fuel down to make sure that the fuel gets to the engine. The ones that you have to sell the fuel down, you need what are called ullage motors, which are basically little SRBs to 
push it a little bit to push the fuel down towards the engine to start the engine. In this case, uh, the, the tanks have some sort of pressurization system like helium to push the fuel down automatically, so you don't have to add the little SRBs. Um, so what we want to do is make sure that uh, this is a pressurized tank, or this is a pressurized tank. This says highly pressurized false. Hmm, that's not good, is it? Well, let's see. Um, let's say I put hydrazine in here. This says nominal. Let's say I remove the hydrazine. So this might be pressurized. It says highly pressurized true, okay. So that's highly pressurized true. But let's say it doesn't even give me the option for hydrazine in here, which is the fuel that this uses. Um, let's say we uh, try and find hydrazine in here. Does it even let me have hydrazine in here? Yeah, I don't think it even lets me have hydrazine in here. Well, that brings us to some other topic, which is this one kilonewton thruster is configurable. Maybe I don't want to use hydrazine. Maybe I want the one kilonewton thruster to use this combination of fuel, which is actually more efficient. Um, we can also increase the tech level. Tech level is more for career mode. You might as well go with the highest tech level just by, uh, you know, just go for it. Uh, these are all, you know, historical fuels. This is a very common one in probes today, uh, so it's fair. Uh, can we use it? Now? Well, it has this option now, but it's still highly pressurized false. Let me put it in here. It still says feed pressure too low. So that's not working. Let me remove those tanks. Here, uh, I can add it in here. Here it says nominal. What if I put it in here now? Will it be able to use it? Good question. Good question. I'm glad you asked that. Uh, well, we're going to load it up and we're going to find out. So we'll find out whether this can still run uh, with the fuel in here or whether like we'll have to store it in here and transfer it here. Maybe maybe it would have been better to put it like this. Maybe that's the way to go. And then it'll go through this highly pressurized tank and then be able to feed the engine. But let's put it this other way and see if it all works. In that case, we find out that we really only need one pressurized tank and then it'll all work out for us. Okay, we see that this probe has 992 meters per second and this is where MechJeb uh, comes in. Thrust weight ratio is 0.44, sea level thrust weight ratio is 0.15, important to note that difference. Okay, and the maximum thrust weight ratio as it runs out of fuel is 0.6. The mass of the probe is 0.417. Okay, and you can see the burn time there. So we got those stats. Now what we want to do is launch this into space and just have it be a communication satellite around Earth. Seems like a good idea. Um, first we need a fairing. We only have the stock fairings. Let's just make one that fits. I mean we can make it look a little bit better. Uh, do, no? Do, ah. we, eh, it's okay. All right, stock fairing, and I guess if you really want to be reasonable about it, you'll make clamshell deploy on. Hopefully that won't cause any problems. So, now we have to look at our choice of engines, right? And uh, the other engines, except for the one kilonewton thruster, probably aren't going to be pressure fed. They're probably going to need the ullage motors to help them out. And we're going to use separatrons for that, to sell the fuel down before lighting the engines. This one is pressure fed. If you want to find out whether it's pressure fed or not, it'll be right here. And here it tells you how many ignitions it has. Okay, a word about ignitions. Uh, there's some confusion about what actually limits the engines. Uh, it's a matter of how likely is it that you're going to be safe if you try and light it again. So they test it out and they try and uh, show that the engine is okay uh, it'll be, it'll have a less than one in like a thousand or one in ten thousand chance of failure if you light it once. Then, if they want to show that it has has the ability to light again, they have to do uh, further tests to show that if you light it a second time, it has only a one in thousand or one in ten thousand chance of lighting it again. Um, there is wear and tear on the engines because there are basically explosions going on in them. But the part that's most delicate is sort of the turbo pump. The turbo pump tends to develop cracks and burn through and all that. And in fact, even the Merlin 1Ds from SpaceX developed some cracks. They brought, of course, those came back. They landed the boosters and they found that they were 
issues with the turbo pumps, turbo pumps and they have to improve upon that uh, to make sure that the engines continue to be lit reliably because those are supposed to be lit multiple times. So yeah, uh, they have to certify it to make sure that it can light with uh, reasonable reliability for the second time, the third time, the fourth time. And so this lunar module ascent engine was qualified, was tested to be able to light 10 times. That doesn't mean that it can't light, in real life, it wouldn't have been able to light an 11th time, uh, provided the, you know, whatever it needs to actually ignite. Um, in this case, being pressure fed and all and having everything else working. But uh, it could light 12 times or 13 times, but it's only certified to light 10 times. Okay, this is only certified to light once. And they only needed it to light once because that, that was a launch engine. So that's, that's why they have those limitations. Some of them can light, uh, you know, like unlimited number of times. Like the reason I've used the one kilonewton thruster on the probe is because it has no limit. It has no limit. Okay, that has one. This one has a limit of 36 times. This is also a pressure-fed engine. Uh, this was used on a Apollo service module. So this is the one on the service module that uh, got them into orbit around the moon and brought the astronauts back. It doesn't really look like that. That's because we're only using stock parts. And once you get into part mods, you'll get much better model for that kind of engine. Okay, but let's make our stages. We've got a fair array of engines. Uh, if this was stock, uh, just reasonably, you might use the LV-909 or the Poodle. So uh, let's see, the Poodle is this one. And we see a 327 vacuum ISP. Uh, that's 58 tons of thrust, right? That's uh, 584 kilonewtons of thrust is about 58 tons, 60 tons of thrust. We're not that heavy. We're not that big. We don't need that much. It is more like LV-909 territory, right? 0.68 seven tons and it so happens this engine which is the upper stage engine on the r7 rockets uh, the luna and vostok engine uh, and later r7 rockets as well uh, this seems a lot like the um the regular engine that the lv909 uh right it's about 50 60 kilonewtons in this case 49.4 but as an alternate configuration for 54.5 and uh, ISP 316 is a little bit less than the LV-909. It does have an upgrade here, this alternate configuration. It's also much, much lighter than the LV-909. And that's a trend that you'll see with realism overhaul. Uh, the engines are a lot lighter than in stock. And so that helps a lot. So that more than makes up for it. So what kind of tank would we expect? Well, if I was making an LV-909 stage and, you know, this doesn't always work, you should pay attention to the numbers, but th this seems like around the right size, right? Uh, this would normally be a 4.5 ton tank. So let's see, um, this engine requires what fuel? Kerosene and liquid oxygen. Fine, let's pick the kerosene and liquid oxygen. We know that option was for the one kilonewton thruster. Okay, well we get 4,448 uh, 4, meters per second out of it. it. Takes four minutes to burn that. The initial thrust to weight ratio is 0.93. So here is a general principle. Um, it You don't need a thrust to weight ratio of 1 uh, on the upper stages around Earth. Uh, it can get pretty darn low. You can uh, put up with really low thrust to weight ratios on the upper stages. Uh, 0.9 is fine. 0.8 is fine. Um, you just need, it depends on when you shift, uh, go from the lower stage to the upper stage though. Um, for something that's more than halfway through the flight, uh, it can deal with it uh, with a 0.8 or 0.9 thrust to weight ratio. If it's more than two thirds into the flight, you can probably deal with something like 0.7. If it's only like a thousand, a thousand five hundred meters per second short of orbit, you could probably deal with less than 0.6. And so it goes like that. And the reason you'd want to do that is so that you don't put an extra heavy engine on and uh, you're as efficient as possible. Uh, note that this tank normally would be 4.5 tons in stock and 0.5 tons dry. With real fuels, it's 0.4, uh, I mean, sorry, 4.237 tons with fuel, but only 134, ton, uh, 134 kilograms dry. So it's much lighter. It's uh, about, what is it, uh, four times lighter. So that's helpful. The engine has gimbling. 
It has six degrees of gimbling, so that's good. That's the main re way we control our rockets. You might want vernier thrusters, though, to control roll, because a single engine can't control roll. So these are vernier engines, these LR-101s. They were on the Atlas rocket. It uses the same fuel, kerosene, and liquid oxygen, not in the same fuel mixture. They'll be all right. They're very low-powered. It's not going to throw things off too much. So I'm going to put them on. And two will be fine. We're just trying to control roll. So, in fact, uh, potentially even one will be fine. The main engine can sort of control it with the gimbling, but better to have two to balance it out. And now if we put those two on, we get to a very healthy thrust weight ratio. A little bit less delta V because uh, they're not as efficient as the main engine. And next we need the ullage motors because Again, this does need fuel to be settled. Oops. And it doesn't say that's pressure fed. So you always have to assume that it needs fuel to be settled. So we will put um, medium separation motors. And we'll put it like this. For the separation motors, you might want to tune down the throttle. And you can't throttle limit the the realism overhaul engines they have their thrust and you can't just go you can't just right click on it and then thrust limit it that's not going to work in general uh, here you can the SRBs are different and you can see initially it has one second of burn time and we've got a thrust limit it to have three seconds to give enough time for this one to light the engines in realism overhaul in general take time to ignite they don't ignite immediately okay so that's another very important piece of information. So now we have this and we can put a little decoupler. We could put a fairing around it. Maybe we should just go with a big decoupler like this instead of trying to put one of the stock fairings around it. We could uh, dump this shroud. This is just a matter of styling and put little strut connectors if you want to make it look like a hot stage thing. Uh, we're basically, this is a Russian engine, we're sort of making a Russian style rocket. Um, where did my, uh, did I accidentally, oh I covered the, okay, don't cover the Vernier engines with the little SRBs for Ullage, that would be bad. It is conceivable that uh, in order to help your upper probe out, you might want to put RCS on this as well. We can show how to do that. Maybe you want an upper stage that can do some extra maneuvering. And there's no point though, unless you have an engine that can have multiple ignitions. It would be much more useful to put RCS on the stage if uh, you were using like this RL10 engine, which has 10 ignitions. And that would be a good engine to use with uh, RCS. That's the core of the Centaur stage on the Atlas V rocket and well, Atlas series and uh, Titan series rockets. So, yeah, that, that's a fantastic upper stage, very efficient. You can see a 444 vacuum ISP, and that, that goes up with the other configurations. So, uh, speaking of which, we should probably go to the engine, show you uh, uh, the GUI, and operate this. You can get the better version of this engine, right? And we should rebalance the fuel mixture. Ah, okay, so now we've got two kerosene and liquid oxygens. That's because of the little verniers. So I click show UI here. I hover over it. That's the main engine. That's the verniers. So I click the one for the main engine. Okay. All right. So now we've got a very high thrust weight ratio. Maybe we can sneak another tank in actually. Let's see what thrust weight ratio we have here. Ah, I forgot which one was that one. Ah, well, um, that doesn't seem right, does it? Mm. Oh, it's got the separation motors here. Aha. Ah, 0.68 is not good enough. 0.68 is not good enough. I'll take the high thrust weight ratio, it's good. Okay, what I was going to do is sort of put some sort of uh, gridding here. That just makes me feel better. Okay, so not strictly necessary, but hey. 
Now, that's that's a lot of Delta V. How much do you need to get into orbit? We'll ignore the probe zone uh, fuel for now. Um, we're looking for between 9,000 and 9,500, depending on the thrust to weight ratio of the first stage. The higher the first stage is, the closer to 9,000 you can be. If you've got a low thrust to weight ratio like 1.2, 1.3, you want 9,500. It also does matter about the thrust to weight ratio of the upper stage. So we don't need to worry too much about uh, needing more than 9,500 because our upper stage has a good thrust to weight ratio. Let's just use some big fuel tanks. Uh, I want a nice tall rocket. And we have our selection of engines. Um, we've got, well, let's try this one first. This one can deal with a 76 ton rocket. It's fairly light. Not very efficient though. ISP is only 282 in vacuum and 148 at sea level. This is an old Atlas engine. Okay. And uh, while it can handle it right now. Oh, uh, did I read that wrong? No. I'm concerned about the thrust weight ratio here. Anyway, it's also a kerosene engine. Ah, okay. It didn't have that. Okay. Um, it's a kerosene engine, but as we load it up with fuel, we see that, well, we do have 10,000, not including the stage there, we have 10,000 delta V. So that's good enough to get to orbit, but our thrust weight ratio is low. Sea level 0.92. We could put two engines at the bottom. I mean, that'll certainly solve it. In fact, we could put four there. Um, we could do two. But I feel like this is not the most efficient engine ever. 1.82 thrust weight ratio, definitely enough delta V. This rocket would work, and it would be able to control itself. You know, it's not too bad. I, I mean, it's a tiny probe that we're actually launching. But it's not a bad rocket. Well, it could, it could do much more than this probe, actually. Uh, it's high thrust weight ratio means we could put more fuel in this first stage. And... Why not? <laughs> Why not? Uh, let's let's uh, let's see how much we can do. And we don't even have the highest upgrade for this LRA9 engine. That's a nice thrust weight ratio. 1.64 is nice. Again, you can go as low as 1.2. 1.64 is sort of like space shuttle-ish, uh, fairly reasonable. So much for uh, I was gonna use the proton engine. This is this is actually one of the engines on the proton rocket and make this uh, properly Russian, but hey, I, I, th these are good too. So you could use this. It fits. And this uses a different kind of fuel. But it uh, because there's only one of them, it can't control roll. You can see you get a very good delta V out of that too and about the same thrust to weight ratio as two of two of those engines 94 tons how heavy is it with these engines the proton engines are much more efficient 316 in vacuum so we need to switch out the fuel again so this is one of the complications obviously that you have to make sure to get the right fuel for the right engines So we need to make sure that we, uh, but the Delta V will obviously tell you if you've got something wrong. Uh, you'll be going like, wait, where's all my Delta V? Well, here it is. Okay, uh, it's definitely less Delta V than the Proton engines, but it's a lighter rocket as well. Uh, because the Proton engine is just more powerful. It's got 1,635 kilonewtons, which is more than double what each of these engine ha engines has. And of course, bad ISP here. We could upgrade these engines, but they don't get too much better. Um, 296 is the best one in this lot. It does have gimbling and one ignition, right? These each have one ignition and that one also has one ignition. So we'll talk about how that influences our trajectory in a bit. Um, we've got two engines so we can control roll. There's no problem there. The gimbling is sufficient to handle the the aerodynamics of it. So I think we can just put on launch stability enhancers. 
And here is very important. Remember, it takes some time for engines to ignite in Realism Overhaul in general. So we want to ignite the engines first, wait, and then launch. Okay, I think that covers all the things. We've got electric charge. Um, if we were using remote tech, it would be important to get the right antennae for communications. But usually you don't lose communication on launch. But uh, basically the antennae that you want are exactly the ones that you would think you would need in stock, which are the Commutron 16S or 16, or um, if you have like some sort of uh, other mod with antenna, it's that class of antenna for launch. Okay. Yeah, let's go. This seems fine. Uh, let's call it uh, test. Okay, so here we are, and the trick with launching rockets in in realism overhaul is well we don't need the delta V actually uh, is entirely due to the fact that we can't relight the engines so you can't just shut it down close to apoapsis and reignite so our goal is to hit apoapsis uh, hit our target uh, one of the ends of our orbit it doesn't matter which one it's probably preferable to aim for the periapsis first and then uh, uh, as our apoapsis so as we go up, we're going to be making our apoapsis be the target periapsis. And then we want to reach that height, actually reach that height at time to apoapsis equals zero. And then we'll hold it there and continue to burn until our periapsis reaches its desired height. Um, well, let me just do it and then we'll see. SAS on, throttle up. Okay, and I use Smart ASS because it allows me to do one degree differences in pitch much more precise than I can do manually or at least hold manually myself. Um, yeah, especially on a long launch like this. It's not that long. I mean, when you take a look at the launch time, we're talking about this rocket will get to orbit in five minutes. It's sort of an Atlas style thing. So it's pretty, pretty quick. Anyway, ignition. See, it takes time, and then launch. Okay. And you could control it manually, but I'm going to start here. This has a very high thrust to weight ratio. Well, not as high as some other rockets, but it's high enough for me to start out right away. I'm going to go to 85 degrees at 1,500. I could easily go to 80 degrees at 2 kilometers. You can see we're right at the bottom edge of the prograde vector right now because it's got a high thrust weight ratio and I'm not turning as fast as I should. We break, we've broken the speed of sound. We're uh, approaching max Q now. You can see it's holding it quite well with the gimbling. Not too much fuss. We are launching out of Cape Canaveral by default, and again in a subsequent video where we add more mods, I will uh, introduce KSC Switcher, which is how you get other launch sites. The trajectory is only a little bit steeper than stock Kerbil, uh, Kerbil, so Kerbil, Kerbil. Not okay. Engines don't throttle. <laughs> This, the, I mean, uh, most engines don't throttle, some engines do. You'll have to check in the VAB which ones do, we'll show that. But this engine does not throttle, so there's no point in me trying that out or anything. You can see our apoapsis is going up. At this point, we're in the thin part of the atmosphere. I want the apoapsis to not be so high. The atmosphere uh, ends at 140 kilometers in realism, uh, real solar system. So I, I want to aim for about 200 kilometers. Really high thrust to weight ratio here. Don't put a Kerbal on here. Not if you've got G-Force stuff on. Okay. And so we can... Now, as we separate, of course, we're going to need to start the engines. If you want to coast here, you can. Uh, you can just let it coast right now. And it'll be completely fair. What? In fact, 
uh, it's a bad example, but uh, we, we can let it coast for a bit. Some rockets do this, and um, it looks like we've got a three minute burn there. So we coast until our time to apoapsis is one and a half minutes. But right now we don't have any way of controlling the trajectory of the rocket except for that tiny reaction wheel on the probe core. So it could deviate eventually. You can see persistent rotation there. So as we time warp, if there's any deviation, persistent rotation will uh, get a hold. You can see it's, it, it does rotate. Okay, right about here would be a good time to light the second stage engine because it's halfway, uh, half, half of the burn. So set and ignition. Oh, throttle. So don't do that. Always make sure your throttle is up when you ignite. But we were saved. Uh, it, yeah, we were lucky. We were lucky this time, folks. We can let go of the fairing. We should have done that before. Ooh, the clamshell fairings don't work so well, I've noticed. So people seem to overreact to how complicated realism overhaul is. It, it, uh, things do take more time, uh, though this rocket is a five minute to orbit rocket um, and could definitely carry more payload, uh, we'll get to orbit with plenty of fuel left. We should see how much mass we actually have left by the time we get to orbit. I mean, uh, sometimes it's more because of the way realism overhaul players play it than anything intrinsic to the system. I mean, uh, it does involve a lot of menus, you know, like the fuel and all that. But it's not overly complicated. Okay, so we're about to hit apoapsis, and so I'm going to go ahead and aim for a 240 by 240 orbit. So as now we're going down, which is quite normal, uh, we do have... We can uh, pitch up a little bit to control how fast we're going down. Try and hold around 240 here. We could use other MechJet menus to help us out to gauge that. Remember that the thrust to weight thrust to weight ratio will get quite high, and so now we're going up again, so we can flatten out. Just hold around here. shut down. Well, 257 by 240. If you wanted to fine-tune it, we could use the engine on here to do so. Um, let's take a look. Delta V stats. We've got 1473 meters per second left here, so we can definitely do more than lift this particular thing. And actually, uh, let's, let's make things a little bit cleaner around here. Uh, well, no, we can't. Dang it. I should have left this on a suborbital trajectory to not leave space junk, but now we've left space junk. We can't reignite this engine, remember, so we can't deorbit it. Alas, and you know if we had RCS on here, we could have deorbited that, but we don't. Or RCS on this stage—that's another thing you could do. So, yep, all right, that's all shut down. Let's separate. Okay, and you might want all y'all at this point, or or act, have action groups of these. By default, uh, Realism Overhaul does have hibernation. It's had it uh, before stock had it. And so um, you can hibernate the probe core to save electric charge. And there, uh, what you got? Some probe cores, um, I don't know if they're just for the career mode or not, will uh, hibernate while you're time warping automatically. I. I don't know if uh, since 1.2.2 and the introduction to hibernation in the stock game, whether they've changed that or not, actually. Okay, but anyway, here is our little probe. Okay, night little engine. And it's all ready to go. Um, we can see it's replenishing electric charge. Uh, we can have it turn. Let's uh, see how fast it turns with the reaction wheel. It's pretty good. It's not bad at all. Certainly, uh, you don't need RCS with it in order to make sure that it gets the orientation it needs to go into. And it's got the science. So yeah, we have successfully delivered a payload to orbit. 
Now let's check that thing with the engines, right? This tank is not pressurized, so let's see if it all works. So right now, draining from there, also draining from here. So, I mean, what happens if I lock this tank? Nope, it's still running off of this tank. Seems to have no problem with that. As long as there's one tank with pressurization on, it can deal with it. So that's an important thing to note. Valuable piece of information there. It's now boosting our orbit a little bit. Now the way real solar system works, um, everything else is inclined by 23.5 degrees because Earth is actually tilted by 23.5 degrees and it uh, keeps everything consistent if you want to match historical stuff. Um, if it wasn't tilted like this, the transfer windows would be very different. So yeah, that's why everything else is tilted. But you can just pretend that the Earth is tilted and everything else is actually flat. To get to the moon, it takes about 3,100 meters per second. And then you need about 800 to circularize around it. But that's all advanced. We've built a basic rocket. Let's go back to the VAB. So there are a number of ways we could have added RCS to this. We don't really need the separate uh, mop propellant tanks anymore. Uh, we could have added the RCS fuel directly into this tank, right, by uh, showing UI. And we know it's 50-50 uh, uh, if we configure it that way. Let's put some RCS quads. So we've got all these. They tell you how many Newtons they provide. There's a variety of them for different size things instead of the one size fits all RCS ports that you get in stock. And so let's put four of these and make sure they're enabled. And uh, let's just go with the MMH and N204 mixture, which is a 50-50 mixture of them. So you just put an equal amount of both. Very convenient. Uh, one reason that I picked that mixture. And uh, we could say, okay, well, all I want is um, 50 units of this. You don't need 50. It could be 25, 25, but uh, in any case, 50 units of this and uh, the rest for the main engine, right? So now you can make that sort of custom thing instead of having extra tanks. And uh, this will be fine. Uh, technically, RCS ports are pressure fed. I don't know how picky this one is. It doesn't actually have an indicator on it. I don't, I, I always, uh, the thing is I always uh, make service module tanks which are pressure fed for them. So just because I do, I would add a set of these, not not quite like that. I wouldn't put it in the main tank myself. It's just an option that you have. Personally, I just like keeping the main tank for the main engine and putting the RCS fuel in these. Um, if you have procedural parts, you can attach these to those and that's probably the best way to go about it. But for now, we can do like that. And it'll be all right. Now we have RCS on that stage. So no complication there. And so I hope, I mean, this shows that realism overall doesn't have to be as complicated as, uh, as all that. But it can get that complicated if you want it to. So we've got a rocket here, but let's see about other types of parts that we might want and how to make our rockets look fantastic, how to get uh, really fancy looking engines and everything and all that, that kind of stuff. So I'll do that in subsequent videos. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.